There's a huge issue with how people track their effort on eBird. If you were one of the 10,000 people who watched my Mistakes eBirders Make video, then thank you. For the rest of you, the problem is that when you are submitting a traveling checklist, eBird wants you to report the total amount of time, but only the unique distance traveled. So if you doubled back on your route, like walking a trail out and back, you should remove the distance that you backtracked from the total distance traveled. eBird has always been clear about this. It is in their instructions, help documents. They reiterate it all the time, but people are people and most people just don't read. The biggest part of the problem is that in 2017, eBird updated their app so that it would keep track of your effort for you. This was amazing, no longer estimating how far you walked or guessing the distance between a half or three quarters of a mile. But it didn't account for backtracking, and most people would start their list, go birding, hit done, hit submit without ever adjusting their distance if they backtracked. This is really important because eBird needs to have standardized distances to be able to compare bird abundances across checklists. They often say they need to calculate via birds per unit effort. A good example to think about this is that if you walked a one mile trail and there was a bald eagle nesting there, then you would get one bald eagle per mile. If you walk that same trail back, it is still one bald eagle along one mile of trail. And it doesn't change whether you've walked two, five, or 10 miles on that total, it's just the same one mile of trail. Well, after eight years and probably millions of records with imprecise effort, we have a fix. The latest update to the eBird app, version 3.4.0 on iOS and I think 3.3 on Android, automatically estimates the unique distance traveled when you have a track running. I've been testing the beta version for a couple weeks and I have to say I'm very impressed. This will be a huge time saver, at least for those of us who did account for our backtracking, but more importantly, we'll provide much more accurate effort data for eBird and their greater scientific impact. To show a couple of examples, one of my favorite patches is Maine Audubon Skills and Farm. I've led a bird walk there most Thursdays for almost 11 years, walking nearly the same route every time. In those early days, back when we had to use bird log, you can see I put down one mile in three hours. <laughs> That's pretty rough. Jumping to this year and using the eBird app with tracking, we get distances of 0 0.96, 0 0.95, and 1.02 miles, the latter probably from running back and forth into the building to get extra binoculars for participants. Then it is interesting to see how using version 3.4 with backtracking, I get 0 0.69 on both of my last walks. Nice. It is fun to see the consistency between these, but obviously a larger sample size will be helpful. I honestly don't think I would have called that much of this list backtracking, but as we'll talk about, the app is pretty conservative in what it calls unique distance. Another fun one I got to test recently is how well it does on a boat trip. Most pelagic trips are going to be moving along pretty steadily with little backtracking, but showing up to an island and circling it a bunch of times leads to a larger total distance on that list. There has been a tufted puffin in the Gulf of Maine for several years now, and it's by far one of my top nemesis birds, but I keep trying. And like this trip to Eastern Egg Rock, despite not seeing the bird again, you can see how the app did a great job with calculating the unique distance. A natural question is what counts as backtracking, or more specifically, how close do you have to be to your previous track for it to not count? Ebert says that they use a buffer of 30 meters, or just shy of 100 feet. I did a little testing nearby by walking around a winding parking lot to see how far I needed to be from my track for it to not count. Here was one loop I walked. It listed the total as 0.25 miles and adjusted to 0.19. You can see here where I turn off to the east, it gets pretty conservative and doesn't count this stretch until I'm actually closer to 150 feet from where I was previously counting as unique. Things were a bit more interesting when I walked that same path but added a little loop up in the middle. I'll note I walked on the exact edge, not towards the middle like the path shows, and there were no cars in those spaces. I mentioned that because the lane was exactly 60 feet wide, and you can see it doesn't count any of that as unique. Walking back down, that lane is 50 feet from the last track, but now I'm over 100 feet from the original track. You can see it going back and forth between 0.08 and 0.09, so whatever calculation it is doing is a bit more complex than just measuring between those two points. It is worth pointing out that the eBird app does track X, Y, and Z axes, it isn't just looking at lat long, so it does account for gains in elevation on your track. 
Beginning last year, they started recording timestamps along the tracks too, so they can see how much time is spent in certain habitats for their analyses. Anyways, you can see as I do keep going, it adds a tiny bit, but then not counting anything as unique for another 150 feet or so. All of this is new, but then getting conservative again as I get back near the original track. So I think eBird stated 30 meters seems a bit low, but that is the distance I use for deciding when a checklist goes from stationary to traveling, so it has some greater significance in that sense too. I've never looked this closely, and it probably doesn't matter for the accuracy of our eBird list, but I think there's some bias in moving the track a little bit here. I deliberately walked right on the edge of either side of the lanes, knowing exactly how far away they were, and walked on the raised sidewalk along the edge, but in both cases it shows my track going right down the middle of the road. Again, this probably doesn't matter for our list, but it seems like there's a little bias from maybe some driving algorithm or something. I only have found one issue with the app update so far, and based on the feedback I'm seeing online, I suspect, or at least really hope, this will get fixed quickly, and it is that you can no longer adjust the time independent of the track. You used to be able to tap on the clock icon and it would update the time recorded on the list based on the current time. Now the time and distance are linked to the track and cannot be edited unless you adjust the length of the track. Ebert has always said in their guidance that you should keep the track running as long as you're doing a checklist. This makes sense, especially now that it is automatically adjusting for backtracking, but I've had many lists where I'll hike out to a point, like a good place to go sea watching, and then do a long count from that point. When I get to that point, I'll stop tracking because I'm trying to save my phone's battery, which does drain faster when tracking is running, especially in areas with bad service. Now the only way to enter your own time is to remove the track entirely, and then you can fill in those blanks. Another thing causing a bit of confusion is that you can retroactively adjust your list with this automatic backtracking. Now you can edit all of your previous lists within the eBird app. If you open up an old one and tap edit, you'll see the distance gets corrected. eBird has said that they plan to migrate all checklists over in the future, though no date was given so you shouldn't waste your time going through years of lists to correct this yourself. This is a good time to remind everyone that tracks are only visible to the people on the eBird list. Only the person who made the list, and then anyone added to that list can see the track. As an eBird reviewer, I often wish I could see where people were, or specifically what habitat they were in when they're otherwise using a vague hotspot. Or when I was working on the Breeding Bird Atlas in Maine, it would have been tremendously helpful during our data quality review. Ebert hinted that these would someday be more public back when they were first announced in 2017. They said, when visiting a hotspot for the first time, you could pull up recent checklists and see exactly where eBirders had been on the trails. All this and more is possible in coming years. Well, we haven't seen any of that, and I'm glad they're putting users' privacy first, but hopefully we can see some aggregated tracks for locations in the future. I hope you found this overview of the new tracks feature helpful. It's been a super busy spring, and I've got some really fun videos coming out soon, so make sure you're subscribed. That is the best way you can help me with my goal of getting the most people to see the most birds. And as always, thank you for watching.